and my boss, Dr. Bushit Mark, that is now in the meeting. And uh, just to let you know that uh, after his uh, presentation, we are going to go straight forward to Professor Mark Bartolo Zago to give his talk because he, he has to leave, then go for, for questions. So, as I mentioned, a great honor. Uh, just to take me 10 seconds to speak of a day that we just had a very nice and a very pleasant uh, and hopefully that will go forward in, in, uh, in results of a, uh, a compromise of a state of Gamma need to have a series of, uh, uh, of projects and commitments and then the people writing out. Well, eventually to uh, well, the uh, the agreement for right now, but uh, then uh, of the first call for proposal, so real call for proposal, real, real money. So, okay, Professor uh, John, make it again. Thank you. Do you listen to me? Yes. What? Yeah. So, uh, the honor is for me, and I'm reading some of uh, the Academy of uh, Science of Brazil for the evening, uh, to speak about excellence in higher education. I don't know if my university is excellent. I don't know really what is excellence. And we can speak about excellence for excellence forever. Uh, since universities really have sort of like player in society, their excellence depends on the, their ability to meet the needs of the society, and especially when uh, this uh, society is undergoing such important changes as today. In my talk, I try to first address the challenges that universities face, and then Try to comment how uh, our university is coping with these challenges in France. So, globalization transforms all processes and all human activities at an unprecedented level, and we observe uh, important shifts in economy and industry towards new sectors as well as toward new continents and you are one of these new continents. And this really put a challenge on our society, the old economies to maintain as much as we can our wealth, and in the new economies to uh, master this uh, development. In the same time, the digital revolution transformed all practices, all habits, all uh, relationships, uh, between uh, people at uh, a very uh, increasing pace and all these change uh, could be characterized as a shift in civilization and as any shift in civilization uh, you could see the good part and be enthusiastic and you could see the difficulties and uh, be uh, afraid of the future and uh, we could see that uh, the Renaissance was a period of development and hope in humanity, but at the same time, it was the end of the Middle Ages, and many, many troubles occurred uh, at the same time. If we see the progress of uh, the civilization, we could see also that our very success places a big burden on the well-being of humanity, question about the global warming, the scarcity of water, the health situation of the majority of the population. In the same time, globalization is not uh, a benefit for all, and it uh, occurs with a very unevenly distribution, with development in some part of the world of hunger, poverty, infection disease, and limitation to access to knowledge. 
And if we want to uh, sustain this new period of the human civilization, we have to cope with these extremely important and hazardous challenges. In the same time, at least in our societies, these developments are going along with a lot of confidence in technology and in science in society at large. So these global challenges call for global answers and universities can stay uh, aside of these issues and should address these issues. And this needs first, of course, more research but new research practices to address this, the complexity and, and the interdependence of the problems uh, humanity is facing. We need, of course, to transfer this new knowledge in the society and in the economy, but more than only uh, by uh, technology transfer and innovation for the development of the industry, we need to build a global knowledge-based society uh, to uh, try to answer uh, at each level uh, the, the questions uh, which are uh, in front of us. And globalization doesn't mean global solutions, but local context-dependent solutions. That means also that research deals with the local situations and the way they could be solved by uh, the progress of, of research and science. Clearly, these new challenges that humanity is facing uh, increase the strategic role of universities by linking even more education and research and linking education and research to societal needs. Let me quote Leszek Borisevich, the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge, who said that if universities, research universities, are so efficient for economy, it's because they don't they they, they are not programmed for that, and that the uh, result in innovation and economy are a byproduct of their primary missions, which are research and education. It's because they are strong in research and education that they could be efficient for economy. This is clearly uh, an answer to the instrumentalization of, of the try to instrumentalize universities by uh, political or economic leaders who want universities to give more for economy, which is right, but the way they think by controlling the development of, of uh, universities, which is beneficial. If the world is complex, it has always been done, but what it has always been, but what is new with the development of uh, knowledge in the 20th century is that it is clear now that the world is contradictory, context dependent, and uh, not linear or coherent. And as a consequence, one simple discipline couldn't cope with that, and we need to develop new avenues of interdisciplinary uh, research and interdisciplinary uh, education to, uh, to progress. The role of research universities is to understand, anticipate, and prepare this transformation of society, to encourage a comprehensive approach to these complex issues, and at the same time to rebuild or to build a framework of confidence, creativity, and responsibility which will be necessary for the, tran the transition we are facing. It's probably more important in the old U Europe which is facing a quite long crisis and which could uh, lose confidence in its future. And uh, we really have to rebuild this trade of uh, confidence and responsibility. The role of research universities is to develop the culture of curiosity, creativity, critical thinking, which make 
uh, our researchers freely exploring new avenue, avenue of uh, knowledge. These discoveries cannot be programmed, cannot be defined by advance, and it's why basic research is so fundamental, not only for the success of the researchers, of the research, sorry, but also for the success of their transfer and of innovation. There is no innovation of demand and the disruptive, the disruptive shifts uh, of knowledge are always uh, unpredictable. Universities have a strong institutional responsibility to allow uh, this capacity of their researchers uh, to uh, explore this avenue of knowledge. Uh, we can't develop all the sectors at the same level. It was said by uh, the, the speaker this morning. Uh, we should focus on the, the best uh, areas of the best researchers uh, in uh, our university, but in the same time, we should ensure a critical mass and a critical diversity of research to confront the evolving challenges. And based on this critical mass of top-notch top, top, top research, uh, we could build transdisciplinary programs associating these top-notch researchers in uh, new, uh, on new subjects. And by this way, uh, we make their research uh, able to be transferred uh, to industry and economy and to society at large. I don't believe that it's the responsibility of a single researcher. Some are doing very well, but not all of them, to uh, be responsible for the transfer, for the innovation, for uh, the creation of uh, a new company, but it's the responsibility of university to build the, uh, the environment which facilitates, which accompanies and which facilitates the transfer of, of knowledge uh, from uh, the, the, the discoveries of our researchers. Of course, the same responsibility occurs at the education level, and uh, we have to change where it was not already done, and it's okay in France where the uh, education uh, is still uh, quite classical, uh, and it's a top-down teaching. Uh, we have to answer uh, the quality of education more by equipping our graduates with conceptual skills and habits, and uh, rigorous methods to make them active in their education by confronting them to real life problems, research based approach. And it's by this active education of uh, active, active learning of the students that they could master what we call the transferable skills. Again, I'm not uh, certain that uh, it would be uh, useful and efficient to teach skills uh, to our students by courses. I don't think that a course of credibility is really efficient, but it's important to develop within the curricula, within the process, by the way we teach, to uh, develop the creativity of our students and to let them uh, again explore uh, their own uh, ways to build their, uh, their knowledge. And by this way, not only we, we train and we produce uh, leaders for the economy and the society, but at the same time we produce informed and responsible citizens. So let's see now how uh, we try to cope with these uh, very important challenges uh, at my university. Uh, as I said, I don't know if we could be characterized as an excellent university, uh, we have no endowment, we have uh, very small fees, we have uh, no um, uh, no fundraising, uh, we elect the board, 
and the board elects the president, and still we try to change the situation. We don't select at the entrance of university. So it just wants to emphasize that there are different models of universities in the world. This morning we had the example of a very efficient model, but we share Brazil and France a different model, and still in this model, with its, with its handicaps, we could change the, the, the situation by uh, engaging in important reforms. So UPMC is the leading university in France, the sixth in Europe, the fifth in, uh, in the world uh, under the, the Shanghai ranking, and uh, we were created in the 70s from the University of Paris, but as the University for Science, Engineering and Medicine. I won't comment on this slide, but I just want to pay uh, my tribute uh, to Brazil and to IMPA uh, for uh, the uh, field medal of Arthur Avila, now working in Paris, and we benefit a little bit of his uh, field medal by this way. But it's, I guess, the, the best uh, illustration of the long-term cooperation between the, the mathematics schools of Brazil and uh, France, of Rio and Paris, and we are very proud and happy uh, for that. As I said, we try to focus in the, in the field of uh, uh, science, engineering, and medicine. We try to focus uh, our uh, strengths in some uh, different uh, domains. I won't comment the slide neither, but what I would say is that in face of the global challenge, we, try, we have to try to, to make some, uh, uh, some understanding of them. We are, at this time, at my university, limited by the way that we uh, encompass only science, engineering, and medicine, and that, we, that we don't benefit at this time of social and human sciences. And it's why we engaged in the uh, building of the university cluster, so one university, which is a comprehensive uh, research university which associates two UPMC leaders uh, in France uh, in their disciplines, Paris Orbonne and Humanities and Social Sciences, the National Museum of Natural History, the Business School in SEAT, the, the Technology University of Compiègne, and along with the, the four main research institutes in France, CNRS in CERN, uh, IBRD in development, and in Real, which are all uh, developing strong collaboration with uh, Brazilian scientists. So the, the objective of this cluster is not to uh, set a new uh, level of bureaucracy, but really to try to uh, uh, uncover the, the frontiers between disciplines and try to cover a complete range of academic domains and to foster uh, interdisciplinarity. Our project, as uh, seven other projects, was uh, elected by the Investing for the Future program and selected by the International uh, jury uh, four years from now, and as I say, it's, uh, uh, our goal is really to, to, to try to reach a more uh, global, uh, comprehensive, uh, world-class research and education. In this way, based on our strengths, again, in the Investing for the Future programs, we developed a series of excellence laboratories which do not um, replace the classical laboratories. We have, we have still our laboratories in physics, uh, mathematics, uh, uh, chemistry, and so on. But these uh, excellence laboratories are uh, interdisciplinary scientific programs covering a large uh, question and uh, with fundamental and applied research. And there is uh, uh, an, an incentive to, to boost innovation from this research. In the same time, these excellence laboratories are uh, 
uh, mobilized to help to strengthen uh, our education, and we have high-level research-based uh, research programs along with this uh, excellence level uh, laboratories. They are addressing the fundamental question, the black matter, and, and so on, but uh, they are also uh, addressing more complex issues about the climate change, and we are developing with uh, uh, University Fluminense here in uh, Rio de Janeiro a program, a mixed program between uh, La Fluminense and UPMC on uh, the uh, global change, global Atlantico. We are uh, addressing uh, issues such as human machine interfaces, cross disciplinary modeling, and the digital world, and again uh, by mixing. Uh, teams from my university and teams from the uh, human and uh, social science university for uh, the veterinary shop. We have also uh, the same approach in the uh, biomedical uh, field. In the same time, we, within Sorbonne University, we foster the emergence of new synergies by uh, programs we call convergence programs, which again assembles researchers from different laboratories, from different institutions to address global issues. We had already four uh, programs which were set on society and environment, the dynamics of the decision, science and cultural heritage, and really for our researchers and for our students, it was an extraordinary opportunity to open their mind uh, to uh, the contribution of the social and human sciences. To foster innovation and to boost the technology transfer, we have set up uh, an innovation center in Compiègne. We are building one uh, at the Jusque campus in the, in the art of the science campus of uh, University Pierre and Marie Curie, where all the services for technology transfer, for uh, entrepreneurial, for uh, the uh, for developing partnership with industry are gathered uh, along with uh, special courses for uh, students interested in management, science and management, or entrepreneurship at the bachelor and at the doctoral college because they are the two levels of education where interdisciplinary, the transversal uh, actions are the, the, the more important. At the bachelor level, we just tried, and it was not exactly in the line of the excellence initiative, uh, we tried to transform the whole uh, structure of our uh, education at the bachelor level uh, the Excellence Initiative wanted us to focus on few, some few examples of uh, excellence programs for uh, a limited number of uh, students, of happy few. And we decided to start this transformation uh, for the whole university. And as I told you, we don't select uh, neither at the entrance of bachelors of so concerns uh, several thousands of students. And uh, the objective is to make our students active in their training. And for the first uh, month of the first year of education, they have to attend a course to think about their uh, expectation from life, from job, and to, uh, think, to reflect on the uh, program they should uh, choose to try to uh, realize their expectations. On the second sem semester, they have research-based workshops. It's not important anymore, but they have to, to, to build a, a project uh, as a team and to try to, to, to develop a, a research uh, attitude, if I, if I would say, uh, in, their, uh, in, in, in these programs. Finally, at uh, the second year, we shift on a major minor system, which was not possible in France till now, 
and each student has the possibility to uh, choose a major and in the same time a minor in any of the disciplines according to its project. So of course we started that at uh, my university and uh, most of the students are taking a, a major in uh, science and a minor in another uh, scientific discipline, but some are taking already uh, human and social sciences and we have different programs which were developed in uh, science and political science, science and management, science and musicology, chemistry and art history, and uh, this year we developed science and Chinese, science and German, not yet science and Portuguese, but why not? Uh, the way we developed science and Chinese is because we have 5,000 students at the secondary school in Paris who learn Chinese. And when they arrive at university, they don't do any more Chinese. So in this program, they go on studying Chinese in the same time as uh, a scientific uh, program, and they would enter in an international master with Chinese universities, and with that, with their diploma, they could uh, really have uh, fantastic careers in uh, companies uh, dealing in uh, uh, economy between uh, China and uh, Europe. German is, of course, because it's uh, the major uh, partner uh, in, uh, in, in Europe, and uh, probably Portuguese would be the, the next one, because we are developing these programs uh, with like a PES, with a FAPES, with, uh, 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 with uh, Brazilian uh, universities, and uh, these programs, as I would say later, is for us the occasion to expose our students to the real world, and not only to attract uh, international students to our uh, university. At the, at the master's degree, we, we did the same thing, and the same introductory. What I could say is that uh, we, we were promoting the, uh, the new uh, vision of doctorate in Europe 10 years ago and uh, insisted that the uh, doctorate was a professional experience of research, but that what was important in the doctorate was the original research and that the skills, again, these transferable skills we are uh, speaking a lot about were uh, mastered through the practice of research rather than by uh, complementary courses. And that we developed the uh, doctoral education not only to uh, feed the, the needs for uh, the sectors of research and development, but also to uh, develop, to transfer the cultural research to any uh, sectors of the society and of the economy. If we want to build a knowledge-based society, we have to develop the, the, the research spirit in all sectors of the society. For some uh, students who want to be engaged in management of uh, economy or of, of administration, we have developed specific programs of PhD and BA, MPPT and BA, or executive doctorate. But again, in this part, there is it's a full scientific thesis and in addition, an MBA to give the complementary skills they need for that project. Finally, our international priorities. When we built our universities, we made the count of the memorandum of understanding the different members of Sorbonne University have signed uh, the uh, last 10 years. It was more than 1,000. That's not a uh, strategy. And uh, the MOU is, if you pronounce it in French, you say MOU, and MOU means soft. So it's nothing, it's just to put in the drawer and taking the dust. So we decided to focus on a very limited number of uh, programs to prepare our students to be active in the global society and to uh, enable our researchers to develop more easily uh, their action. Clearly, internalization for us is firstly a domestic objective. It's to expose our students to the, to the world. It's to attract international students to share the courses with 
uh, our French students, and but it's not a market. I told you we don't have fees and uh, attracting internal students cost for uh, university. But it's essential for our students to be educated alongside with foreign students. This strategic university partnerships, of course, in Europe, because we have this uh, immense objective to uh, build the European area of research and higher education and to uh, overpass the, the, our frontiers, not only our geographical frontiers, it's already done more or less, but our cultural frontiers, and that's quite more difficult. And of course, in the world, uh, besides uh, uh, our partners in North America, uh, we focused on the new economies, Brazil, China, India, and uh, South Africa. And what we want to build uh, is bilateral exchanges. Again, it's not to attract students or researchers for our universities, of course. Uh, if we attracted more than one Arthur Vela, but a series of the most brilliant uh, Brazilian researchers who would be stronger and we will be excellent, and we will, be, and we will climb in the Chamber ranking, but it's not our interest. Our interest is, of course, to, to get very good researchers, but really to, by these bilateral exchanges, to give the opportunity to our students to have internships in the other countries. And the, the programs we, we built with La Capes, with uh, La Faberge, and with some of our university partners is really to allow uh, these bilateral exchanges uh, and to focus these exchanges on uh, transdisciplinary <coughs> programs because it will help us to create this transdisciplinary spirit in our university, it will help our uh, partner to uh, overpass the frontiers within uh, its university and it would be uh, for, for the rest of the world. So, if I would like to, to conclude, I would say at this step that, again, the question is not for me to be excellent for being excellent, but to be the best we could to serve the society, and to serve the society being a university independent in its research and education, but to, uh, to meet uh, the challenges uh, our society is uh, facing. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Lechelle, for the enlightening uh, presentation. So, uh, nós vamos agora para a apresentação do professor Zago. 20 minutos, depois teremos as perguntas para os palestrantes. Professor Zago, que é o reitor da Ok, é, muito boa tarde. Muito obrigado pelo, pelo convite, oportunidade de falar com este grupo. É, obviamente, é, a temática proposta, autonomia, governança, financiamento, avaliação, avaliação seria suficiente para um simpósio de uma semana e, portanto, eu não tenho nenhuma expectativa de cobrir isso aí minimamente. Portanto, eu vou tomar alguns aspectos apenas como parte desta é, discussão, tá certo? E é, quero lembrar que nós temos que voltar ao mundo real. Mundo real que tem quatro características importantes quando se trata das universidades brasileiras. Tem lei 8666, tem estabilidade de todos os servidores, não apenas dos docentes, dos cozinheiros, dos ascensoristas. Terceiro, tem isonomia obrigatória, não tem escala de salários que pode ser negociada. E quarto, tem gratuidade garantida pela Constituição. Portanto, é nesse ambiente que nós temos que trabalhar e eu vou usar, obviamente, aspectos da Universidade de São Paulo e, de vez em quando, para lembrar disso, mostrarei alguns 
dos, uh, das peças que fazem parte do acervo do principal Museu de Arte Contemporânea do Hemisfério Sul, que faz parte da Universidade de São Paulo. Assim como hospitais, creches e outras coisas. Muito bom. E é uma universidade que dizem que está em crise. E lembrando a sabedoria milenar dos chineses, que para escrever crise usam dois ideogramas. Um que diz perigo e outro que diz oportunidade. Portanto, crises são, sim, situação de perigo, mas também oportunidades para o Muito bom. Mudanças que no mundo estão ocorrendo, como o professor Capaz já disse, rapidamente, mudanças em todos os aspectos da sociedade. E não são coisas transitórias, são coisas que estão aqui para ficar. Quer dizer, a sociedade do conhecimento, tá certo? a mudança ali dos eixos políticos e econômicos do mundo, tá certo? as mudanças é, globais e, 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 e do meio ambiente, não é? portanto, a importância da água, da universidade, da energia, as mudanças populacionais, a questão da produção de alimentos, e a velocidade das mudanças tecnológicas. Muito bom, o mundo está mudando. E as universidades? Estão mudando. Uma coisa interessante é que os membros das universidades, de um modo geral, e nós podemos fazer generalizações nesse aspecto, são geralmente liberais, são esquerdistas, na política e na economia. Mas as universidades são extremamente conservadoras. Como já havia reconhecido Clark Clark, que já foi lembrado aqui nesta reunião hoje, porque foi quem realmente estabeleceu esse sistema de três níveis diferentes do estado da Califórnia, tá certo? lembrando que poucas instituições são tão conservativa, conservadoras quanto as universidades quando se trata de seus próprios negócios embora os seus membros sejam absolutamente liberais quando dizem respeito a todas as outras coisas. Então, neste mundo em que as universidades são conservadoras, os membros da universidade são absolutamente liberais e progressivas, e progressistas, como é que nós mudamos a universidade? Ora, por que, que a universidade é muito lenta para mudar? Porque tem algumas coisas que realmente liberdade acadêmica a outra é que a estabilidade é para sempre reitores, administradores entram e centram, entram com seus planos mas a estabilidade me garante e eu não tenho nenhum problema nunca e o sistema universitário sempre se isto é, o sistema ratifica a si mesmo porque ele é extremamente, muito pouco exposto a qualquer controle social, a qualquer controle que tem que Está certo? A, má, a, importância, a coisa mais importante na universidade, embora nós achamos que seja produzir é, na verdade, é reproduzir-se a si mesmo. E, desta forma, nós não conseguiremos mudar a universidade enquanto nós não mudarmos a maneira como os professores da Universidade de São Paulo. Bem, os aspectos aqui lembrados da, da autonomia, não é, da governança, eles, são, eles derivam de algo que está garantido na nossa Constituição. As universidades gozam de autonomia didática, científica, administrativa e de gestão financeira e patrimonial e obedecerão ao princípio da indissociabilidade entre ensino, pesquisa e extensão. Existem aqui dois sonhos. A nossa universidade é uma... Já, ah, desculpem. A nossa Constituição já foi descrita como uma Constituição sonhática. É? Ela dissemina sonhos, mas nenhuma das coisas são realidade. De qualquer maneira, o primeiro sonho, quando ele foi escrito, ele era muito mais limitado. Porque dizia o seguinte, as universidades gozam de autonomia didática, didática científica, administrativa e de gestão financeira e patrimonial nos termos da lei. Nós devemos ao professor Gutenberg e suas pressões junto à promotora, etc., terem retirado isso. Ficou como está. O que é uma, um sonho muito mais amplo. Mas se for ver, poucas universidades brasileiras, de fato, se aproximam desta... desta perspectiva que é 
Talvez seja bom fazer referência à governança da Universidade de São Paulo, que nem todos conhecem exatamente é, em que, que ela se baseia. Em primeiro lugar, ela é uma das três universidades mantidas pelo, pelo governo do Estado de São Paulo, que elas não são federais, não são. Juntas, elas recebem 9,57% da, da principal uh, taxa, que é o ICMS, que o governo do Estado recolhe. Isso significou, uh, neste ano, cerca de 10 bilhões de reais. 10 bilhões de reais para três universidades. Elas têm, por exemplo, a USP tem completa e absoluta liberdade de gastar o seu orçamento. E esse ano se aproxima de 5 bilhões de reais. Gasta o quanto quiser em salário, em pesquisa, da maneira como quiser. Os empregos têm que ser criados pela Assembleia Legislativa. Mas nós podemos contratar, uma vez que os empregos existem, desde que haja recursos. E. O outro tópico importante da, da relação dentro da governança é que o governador do Estado seleciona um dos três nomes que lhe são encaminhados numa lista tríplice para ser o reitor. Esta é a autoridade direta que o governador tem sobre a, a universidade. Deixa eu ler um. Bom, ele escolhe de uma lista que é elaborada por esse tipo de colégio eleitoral, no qual participam os professores titulares, associados, doutores, assistentes, alunos de graduação, é, alunos de pós-graduação, funcionários e representantes da comunidade e ex-alunos. O que chama atenção, obviamente, é que entre 2.100 eleitores, a representação da comunidade externa à universidade é extremamente pequena. É, por outro lado, predomina o componente de acadêmico representado por professores em diferentes, em diferentes escalas, em diferentes níveis, e, de fato, o predomínio é daqueles mais é, é, estão mais, mais titulados. A organização difere muito, imagino, daquilo que a maioria das universidades, tá certo? em que o reitor é, tem uma série de, é, de órgãos administrativos e acadêmicos diretamente ligados a ele, e ele preside o conselho universitário. E esse conselho universitário é constituído desta maneira. No caso da USP, são 122 membros representados por aqueles que têm cargos e que estão lá presentes em ex ofício. Então, o reitor, o reitor, o reitores e os diretores de unidades. E aqueles que estão lá representando, representando as congregações, etc., as diferentes categorias, os representantes de estudantes e, novamente, os representantes da sociedade, que são, neste conjunto, extremamente reduzidos. Muito bom. O outro aspecto é, a ser considerado nessa, nessa discussão é como que se geram os recursos que representam, que dão vida à universidade. A maior parte desses recursos vem, como eu disse, da transferência direta do governo do Estado. Isto é, são recursos obtidos de forma não competitiva, não submetida a qualquer meta previamente estabelecida, tá certo? e que não estão sujeitos a nenhum tipo de controle social. O único controle é depois de executado ver se, tecnicamente, os gastos foram feitos corretamente ou não, obedeceram a lei 866 ou não. Então, a, 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 grande, a grande quantidade de recursos da universidade é obtida dessa forma. Da forma competitiva, com base em avaliação por pares, com base é, na dependência de resultados, que tem algum tipo de avaliação externa, esses recursos são muito reduzidos, representam a, aproximadamente 20% dos recursos da universidade, 
grande parte deles vem de agências federais, FAPESP e outros que são contratos de pesquisa. Bem, nestas circunstâncias que eu mostrei, eu entendo que as grandes fraquezas desse sistema é, representado pela Universidade de São Paulo e que, de certa forma, representa também o que ocorre com as suas duas outras irmãs, a Unicamp e a Unesp, e eu não sei até que ponto representa as demais universidades e universidades federais, os principais pontos são, primeiro, que há um controle quase nulo, externo, sobre o planejamento e a vida da universidade. Quase nenhuma influência. A, a ausência de qualquer tipo de link entre orçamento e planejamento. Uma vez que o orçamento é dado pelo governo, ponto, está certo, e nós sempre, claro, vamos achar que é pouco. O, e, e, portanto, esse orçamento depende essencialmente de recursos vindos do governo. E isso não depende nem de avaliação externa, nem de, de, de controle, nunca é obtido na base competitiva. É, portanto, o controle social da universidade é muito importante. Um outro aspecto que eu é, vou aproveitar para falar um pouco, porque acho que é, é relevante nas nossas universidades, é de que forma que nós podemos interferir, se é que é possível interferir, para quebrar um pouco a segmentação, vamos dizer, introduzida nas universidades pelos departamentos. Quer dizer, a vida departamental introduz é, modificações, introduz segmentação, que, a meu ver, começou, nesses últimos anos, a ser lesiva a vida da universidade. É, e aqui eu gosto de lembrar o meu autor preferido no que diz respeito à vida e ao pensamento das universidades, que é Paulo Jaspers. E ele aponta que a questão da divisão da universidade em diferentes aspectos, quer dizer, a, o ponto em que nós colocamos essa divisão é absolutamente convencional, está certo? E, e, e isso significa o seguinte, que de tal forma que, talvez, os, é, as pessoas, os cientistas, os scholars mais criativos, mas não encontrem a universidade como ela é, um local que lhe seja adequado. Porque não é bem esse professor que nós queremos. Nós gostaríamos de alguém que fizesse exatamente aquela outra coisa. Que está dentro daquilo que nós já dividimos aqui o mundo. Tá certo? Esse sujeito não se enquadra muito bem. Então, as pessoas mais brilhantes, provavelmente, não encontram espaço nas nossas universidades, que sempre vão preferir alguém um pouco medíocre, mas que se enquadre muito melhor naquelas divisões já pré-estabelecidas. Aliás, ele fala uma outra coisa também que não está aqui, descrevendo os concursos universitários, e que foi em 1946, mas eu acho que não mudou muito. Ele diz que dificilmente o indivíduo mais brilhante será escolhido num concurso universitário. Tá certo? Também a banca não vai escolher o pior, porque fica feio. Vai escolher o que está lá em segundo, em terceiro lugar, que nunca vai ameaçar aquele que está na terceira. Eu acho que isso continua verdadeiro. Mas ele aponta para a necessidade de reunificar o pensamento da universidade. Bem, nós procuramos. Ah, antes, não é popular. É, nós procuramos fazer isso na USP nesses últimos anos, tivemos um progresso razoável e eu tenho, mas eu, nós vamos persistir. Uma delas foi é, um grande esforço para criar grupos de pesquisa interdisciplinares. E o outro, é, através da, das, da, das relações internacionais, também desfazer um pouco esta segmentação é, existente na universidade. É, tomando cuidado com essa história de interdisciplinaridade, porque essa tende a virar uma palavra vazia, tem sido abusada não é, exageradamente, sem que se apresentem é, atitudes concretas, ou maneiras concretas de executar. É? Nós é, partimos, 
de uma ideia que, eh, de fato, já existia, aproveitamos uma ideia que já existia na Universidade de São Paulo, que, como a maioria das universidades, é dividida em escolas, departamentos, áreas, mas, que servem muito bem, ou aproximada bem, hoje acho que nem para ensino servem muito bem, mas para administração, mas que não servem para pesquisa. Claro, pesquisa muito mais interessante, nós temos a pesquisa organizada com base em temas centrais e que extrapola os limites departamentais e que se reorganizam à medida que isto vai progredindo. Da maneira prática de fazer isso, foi na Universidade de São Paulo criarmos um programa em que se dava algum recurso adicional para aqueles que participassem, desde que eles fizessem uma proposta que rompesse os limites departamentais. Com isso, foram criados grupos de pesquisa interdisciplinares nas diferentes áreas do conhecimento, como, por exemplo, os que estão listados aqui. Serve como exemplo, está certo? De neurociências aplicadas, de pesquisa em doenças inflamatórias, em bioenergia sustentável e assim por diante. Da mesma maneira, nas áreas de ciências exatas e engenharia e nas humanidades. Né? Exemplo de um desses grupos, por exemplo, é um grupo de bioenergia sustentável que trata, portanto, da questão da bioenergia é nos diferentes campos da Universidade de São Paulo. Em São Paulo, em Verão Preto, em São Carlos, Lorena, Piracicaba, e em cada um deles há uma maior concentração em alguns tópicos desta questão que, que é comum que interessa a todos. Tá certo? É, e que passa, portanto, desde biomassa para é, energia até os aspectos sociais, econômicos, industriais, etc. Bem, o outro instrumento que nós temos tentado usar para também fazermos um progresso nesse aspecto é a questão das a, a, relações internacionais, criando grupos de pesquisa mistos da Universidade de São Paulo com aqueles de outras universidades. É, Bem, pausa. Isto, embora não tenha feito ainda nenhum efeito importante sobre o grau da produção da Universidade de São Paulo, mandei mais ou menos estado em relação à produção é, do país, mas sim fez já um efeito muito grande no que diz respeito aos número ou a percentagem de trabalhos em cooperação, em colaboração, feitos na Universidade de São Paulo. Tá certo? Esta é uma base geral de 2007 a 2011, mostrando a cooperação do Brasil como um todo, com diferentes países, e a USP em particular. Isto é, número de ou percentagem de trabalhos publicados no Brasil ou na USP tem coautoria com outros países. E mostrando a evolução recente disso, tá certo? E eu até achei que tivesse feito algum erro, mas eu chequei com o Vitor e disse que é isso mesmo. Então, deve estar certo, porque sabe que é quanto direito. É. O Jorge não concorda. Mas eu tinha falado Tá bem. Não, mas o importante era a, a, a média brasileira e ver que a USP espero que continue crescendo. Tá bem. É, era, esse, era esta, vamos dizer, a contribuição que eu podia trazer aqui nesta reunião. Obviamente, não cobre tudo o que faz parte da pauta. Ah, mas eu espero que ajude na discussão e uma visão muito segmentada nesse momento. Muito obrigado. É que este curso precisaria ser revisto para entender se o impacto que ele fez é o mesmo daquele das pessoas que ele teve, é aquele que as pessoas que o fizeram sonharam que ele teve. Ah, esse é o primeiro tópico. É, o segundo tópico é também importante, é que Qualquer dessas iniciativas, elas, para serem bem-sucedidas, precisam de um campeão. Precisam de um lutador que estabelece, faz funcionar. É, 
é claro que tudo isso precisa sempre ser institucionalizado, mas nós sabemos que apenas a institucionalização não faz mudanças. O que faz mudanças são pessoas convictas de que precisam fazer e se dedicam a fazer. Tá certo? E são reconhecidas por isso. E este é um aspecto muito importante hoje na Universidade de São Paulo. É que muitas atividades que são essenciais para a vida universitária deixaram de ser reconhecidas como é, relevantes. Dar um bom curso de graduação deixou de ser visto como relevante na Universidade de São Paulo. Isso é péssimo. As pessoas não são cobradas por isso e, portanto, eu vi exemplo de um professor que acabou de ser contratado na Faculdade de Medicina de Ribeirão Preto, Departamento de Cirurgia, e no dia seguinte eu não posso mais fazer cirurgia agora porque eu preciso produzir trabalhos para publicar. Isto é uma completa distorção da vida e da visão da universidade. E eu acho que nós precisamos restaurar essa visão da o que é que são coisas relevantes na universidade. É isso. Eu queria perguntar para o senhor o que, que o senhor acha que a gente pode consertar, por que que pode, que, onde é que a gente pode começar? De isonomia, é, eleição para reitor, partido político na universidade, a gente tem que começar por alguma coisa, porque eu cheguei à conclusão que se a gente quiser consertar tudo, não vamos consertar nada. Então, a gente pode começar por onde? O que, que é mais fácil? Onde é que, onde é que dá para ver luz no fim do túnel? Olha, eu não, não sou a pessoa para dar conselho. Só posso dar um. Não comece enfrentando uma greve de funcionários. Não sei, professora. É, eu acho que o que faz a universidade é, não é o que É o conjunto de lideranças que existem dentro da universidade. Foi isso que fez, por exemplo, a Universidade de São Paulo ser muito forte no Brasil. Foi isso que fez com que as duas reformas universitárias pelas quais ela passou, a certa de 68, 69, que resultou na cassação do, 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 do vice-reitor que estava em exercício, etc., e a outra, em 88, na época do Rodenberg, fez com que os debates que lá ocorriam fossem do mais elevado nível, tá certo? tratando das questões centrais da universidade e conduzido por pessoas que eram reconhecidas por toda a sociedade, com pessoas muito relevantes. Hoje, nós temos um debate que é muito fraco. Pessoas que, investidas de sua representatividade sindical, querem conduzir os destinos da universidade. Se os acadêmicos não reassumirem o seu papel, não há salvação. Não há lei, não há determinação governamental, não há reforma de ministro, não há troca de reitor que mude isso. Ou os acadêmicos retomam a universidade com toda a força, ou não há futuro. Eu sinto muito ser pessimista. Olha. level, at the master level, 
at the doctoral level, and that you don't you don't enter anymore, you shouldn't enter anymore at university at year one with the only uh, in a tunnel going to year eight or ten, and if you leave before, you miss something. So we have level, we organize this education by level of knowledge and competences, and that's the main uh, aspect. Uh, it was to facilitate mobility, uh, we, uh, it was introduced uh, the credits, and credits were overused. And uh, we, uh, when I was uh, chairing the uh, Council for Doctoral Education of the European Association of Universities, we, are fight we were fighting very hard against the European Commission and some countries who wanted to introduce credits at the doctoral level. We would have uh, one credit for uh, an abstract, two credits for a conference, three, and, and so on. It, it was no more a thing, it was no more a credit. It was just a slice of uh, ham and, uh, and, and cheese and, and so on. So uh, credits could be useful to organize the curriculum, but couldn't uh, master the curriculum. So the, the question is that uh, with this organization at three level, it's easier, of course, to organize uh, cooperation, collaboration, and exchange of students. Uh, most of education now in Europe is organized by semesters. And so uh, we, we try to develop, and there is a, a European program, Erasmus, Erasmus Plus, uh, to, to, to foster exchange of students. But still, it concerns hundreds of students, and we have uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of students. So uh, we didn't have yet find uh, the, the lever to, to develop this mobility of students as much as we could. But uh, definitely, uh, yes, the, the generalization of the, of the Bologna process, which is not uh, applied in any country in the same way, but facilitates the, the comparison and the changes. But what is the more fascinating uh, for, uh, as uh, an obstacle for, um, for mobility, for student mobility, is again the conservatism of the, of the faculty. Uh, in our universities, it's very difficult to obtain from some professors to uh, uh, accept a semester in another excellent uh, European university uh, to, uh, as, uh, to, to, to win the, the credits they would have at home because they don't have followed exactly the same course, the same, uh, the same program, which is totally absurd because the experience they get in another university is more important and more beneficial. So we have some instruments, not enough money to develop mobility as much as we should, uh, and again, we have to fight against the conservatism of the faculty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They call scientific population is Brazil. By France or France Brazil is uh, increasing this time. What, what is your view on that? Globally increases. I, I guess that it, it's uh, it's increasing. Uh, the way it is increasing is more questionable. So we have uh, uh, the, the scientific relationships. I didn't uh, talk a lot uh, about the, 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 the scientific cooperation between our researchers because I think that uh, the institutions play a very little role in that. As it was said, we, we need champions and when uh, international uh, scientists want to work together, they just work together and we have to, uh, to give a little bit of uh, facilities uh, for them to, to work together but we don't have to interfere. So these collaborations are developing. Uh, the way the cooperation uh, develops at the education level uh, is dealing with uh, bureaucratic processes. And uh, Georges uh, knows very well and is uh, uh, probably even more upset than I am of the poor results of the French agency dealing with international cooperation uh, with uh, CAPES and with other institutions. So uh, uh, 
for example, this, uh, this agency, which is Campus France, uh, does not allow in practice Brazilian students to choose the university they want to go in. And very, very few Brazilian students could attend my university and research universities because Campus France is training still Brazilian students in all universities, uh, research or not research universities. So it is increasing. There is a, a, a great um, a will of the French universities to develop with Brazil. We are, of course, uh, looking at the new economies and from a French uh, point of view, uh, if you have to choose between uh, Brazil, India, and China, Brazilians are cousins, are brothers. And so it's, our culture are so, are so close. It's the, the primary country, the, the first uh, visit I paid when I was elected president was to Brazil. And I went to uh, China the, the year after, and I'm going to India this, uh, this winter. So of course we are dealing with these countries, but there is much more to do with Brazil, and Brazil as uh, uh, a port for Latin America. Well, first, thank you for your very beautiful presentation. And based on the generality and richness of what you said, I dare to ask you a very simple question. At the same time that we are increasing our excellence, whatever the excellence is at the universities, you see in the world a very, very high level of religious orthodoxy that spans not only what we think we know in the Islamic world, but it's all over. And if you want to look at the States, or if you want to look at Latin America, the same thing happens. We are failing in the science culture. What is the responsibility of the university in that sense? Enormous. Uh, we don't have all the responsibilities on, on our shoulders, but of course we have to, um, to better explain it. It was, a, I tried to say in my poor English when I speak about building a, a frame of uh, confidence, of uh, responsibility. So explaining that uh, things are not easy, that things are not simple, that you can't uh, simplify uh, the problems we are facing so easily that there is no one miraculous solution. But against, uh, among all the, uh, the orthodoxy uh, you mentioned, you forgot one in my sense, is the non-stop TVs. The way you are submerged by fast, inexact, uh, simplified information all day, all day long does not allow people uh, to uh, reflect uh, and, to take, uh, and to take time to reflect. So we have really to, to engage uh, universities, but mostly uh, our faculties, in uh, what we call the dialogue between uh, science, culture, and society, and giving uh, our citizens uh, clues to think and to make their informed choices. We don't have to choose for them, but we have to uh, communicate some clues to better understand the world and to make the, the best decisions. But we don't, we, we are not helped at all, neither with these uh, orthodoxies or with this uh, uh, new way of uh, garbage communication. Well, I have a, uh, probably a large surprise. But, uh, uh, touching the part, uh, since the uh, last part of the talk about the transfer to the industry or transfer of the results of the university, both for you and, uh, as Bruce Darling, uh, pointed out that you cannot know what we turn into publication. So, uh, but, like uh, you mentioned, 50% of the GDP of the United States would not be bought without basic science. And uh, you, you highlight the same. But on the other hand, that's quite important. The, the 
patients trust you, they want to trust you, but how do you select your priorities in, in your universal or in the clusters or bond clusters in order to cope both with the service in the search but also trying to have a uh, higher uh, possibility of a success in terms of the application? Yeah, but the, the question is clearly that uh, you can program uh, discovery or innovation. So you, the, the only thing you could do is to to be as excellent as you could in in the discipline and to to create the, the, the best condition for research to develop. That's the first point, and that uh, needs time. The, the difficulty we face. Uh, in uh, institutions as university that our time is long and the time of politics and of uh, media is short. So uh, politics needs uh, rapid results to be reelected. We don't care if we are not or not reelected because universities are still uh, working and that the researchers uh, need time. If we see uh, another Nobel Prize associated with uh, University Pierre Marie Curie, as well as Collège de France for Economic and Superior, um, Serge Laroche, uh, his research, and you, you invited him more than once here, uh, his research took 35 years, and he, does not, he, he doesn't know yet uh, how long, he doesn't know yet how long it will, uh, um, it, it will last to be transferred to some aspect of economy, and it's not his problem. The problem is that this uh, discovery would one time be useful and that's not the, the, the whole answer. The other aspect is that as university, the researcher has to do his research the best. The university has to be attentive to the possibility of transfer and innovation and facilitate this transfer when it could occur. And that's the responsibility of the university. It's a collective responsibility. And, and institutional responsibility, not an individual responsibility of researchers. And at this time, at least in our in my country, we put uh, too much burden on, on the shoulder of the, of the researcher. And uh, we, we should consider the team and the institutional responsibilities. Okay. I'm sorry to be questioned. Mr. Jacques I would say that the collaboration is uh, very good at the level of the university. It's doing very well. However, for instance, I think that there are a thousand of engineering students which you live in France. We have a big project for so long for students. So it's going well. I'm proud that the professor in Samba present to us related to our part of science of our world. Because we need to have a part in each country. And in this case, first, we know that the last uh, year is uh, some problem for working directly with each one of the professors. We are candidate to, uh, to, to be direct uh, counterparts of CAPES uh, in France and to deal directly with the, uh, with the agency rather than passing by the state uh, French agency. Well, uh, let's thank and again. One more? Oh, sorry. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. In the past, you know, uh, the Ministry of Science was time of all the wars and all the There was, uh, in Brazil, I want to point out that uh, for the service involving the young people, uh, in mathematics, it was the cornerstone of the excellent uh, cooperation we have in mathematics. It was very bright. Uh, also do. Very bright young people came to Brazil and they stayed one, two years. Among them, Mario Cruz, the field analyst. 
playing with words and using with them, but not only him, others outstanding mathematicians like uh, Dan Jane and so on. I don't know how also do with the paper of uh, recreating not the military service. Not at all. But the possibility of this early exchange of uh, very bright uh, young people from both sides who stayed uh, perhaps with uh, uh, science without borders or to stimulate that. So very bright young people different areas of knowledge uh, from both sides that can be remarkably, remarkably uh, fruitful as we have a very good example. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm not in favor uh, of retablishing the military service in France, <laughs> even if mine was nice. But we, we have, uh, in, in the agreement we signed with the FAPERGE, uh, this is included. And we should launch uh, quite soon uh, a call, uh, which include uh, long term, not that long, but we could envisage long term and longer term uh, exchange of scientific be between our institutions. My objective is uh, first to expose our graduates to the reality of other countries, of their civilizations, their culture, their economy, because we need to open ourselves to the rest of the world. We are no more leaders of the world and we have to, to adapt to, to this new reality. And in our um, excellence initiative in Sorbonne University, we, we put a little, it's not that much money, but we put a little uh, uh, money to uh, favor this exchange and uh, I'm uh, uh, extremely uh, focused on the fact to send young, brilliant French, or studying in France, uh, people to Brazil first, and of course to uh, host uh, excellent Brazilian uh, students uh, in France. But uh, it won't work if it's not reciprocal. I totally agree with you. Totally agree. But the way your minister uh, told that to our minister in Paris last week, uh, made some waves, and uh, we could hope that something would change in France more globally too. Okay, well, thank you very much.